Good morning. Hey, nice to be back with you. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, my time here a few weeks ago, and I've been bragging to your pastor about you. So don't disappoint me this morning, okay? Uh, God is doing some amazing things in the hearts and lives of students uh, at Arizona State University. Often, when we think about mission field, uh, we think about faraway places. Uh, but missions has very little to do with a geographic location. But mission has everything to do with people. And at Arizona State University, it's been a joy uh, for my wife and I to serve over 34 years. And we have seen some great stuff God is doing. Um, my age, uh, partying with college students and getting paid for it, it should be a crime. And yesterday, we spent a long time, started at 6 in the morning, came back about 1 o'clock in the morning with uh, 86 uh, students to the Grand Canyon. So if any of you motivated to put in a full day of work, uh, let me know. But it was great opportunity on these trips. We don't get to share much about spiritual things, but it's a good time to build relationship. And our Friday night's been record attendance. Uh, students coming, none of them are believers. Uh, we had 70 plus. They come uh, because we feed them. Uh, college students love food. But also, they find our place to be a home, away from home. It's a family. We, we do a lot of dialogue. We want to know what students are thinking. And we don't get to harvest uh, too many students because we reach them, and, and they are on their way back to their homeland, especially with the visiting scholars. They are only here for 11 months. But God did something amazing in the last three weeks. I, I want to show you a couple of pictures. This young lady, uh, one on your right, is my coworker, Chrissy. For the first time in her life, she was able to lead someone to Christ. And we were in San Diego in a vacation. She called me up and she said, Phoebe, uh, this young lady uh, on your left looked like a junior high, but she's a professor. Uh, she has a PhD and she's a professor in China. And we knew that God is at work in her because the way she asks questions, the way she interacts. But uh, three or four weeks ago, uh, Chrissy was able to lead her to Christ. And pray for Phoebe. She has already gone back to China. And our desire is that God will bring believers into her life uh, to disciple her. And this couple, Chrissy in the middle, this couple, they are also professors in China. And you could tell when God is at work in somebody's life, the way they uh, ask questions, the way they, you, the thinking mode, so to speak. And they've been uh, attending a Chinese church. But uh, last week, uh, they also accepted Christ, the couple. And they're also gone back. Somebody wanted to clap their hand, that's all right. Uh, pray for them. Uh, some of the students go back to countries. There's not a whole lot of church like Redeemer Bible. And we are called not to make converts. We are called to make disciples. And these people need to be plugged into a church. So in, in the back uh, table, there's uh, some information about our ministry. Uh, please take one. And this morning, I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your Bible to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 21. John, chapter 21, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 19. I, I titled this message, Jesus, the God of New Beginning. And I want to... I wanna, tell you a, a true story that happened in 19, 
29. But today you could Google it and you'll find this story. It was the biggest game of Roy Riggle's college football career. The Rose Bowl in Pasadena. The two teams were playing were Georgia Tech Bulldogs and the University of California. Roy was a defensive end for the Georgia Tech. And right before the halftime, he recovered a fumble. The crowd of 80,000 stood in still silence as he brushed up tackles. And finally, one of his own teammate, Billy Loom, got him down at the two yard line. Roy ran with all his power, his might, and determination, but there was only one thing wrong. He ran the wrong direction. And eventually scored a safety, which is a two point for the opposing team. It was halftime, and all the players took off to the locker room wondering what Coach Price is going to say. Players were gathered for the pep talk, but Roy sat on the corner. His head was buried in his big hands with a sense of guilt and shame and disappointment. To everyone's surprise, Coach Price simply said, the same team that started the game will start the second half. Players got up and started out to the field, except Roy. He did not move. Coach Price looked back and called him, but he still didn't move. Coach Price came over and said, Roy, didn't you hear me? The same team that played the first half will start the second. Roy looked up, and his cheeks were wet with a strong man's tears. Coach, I can't do this to save my life. I ruined you. I ruined the university. I have ruined myself. I can't face that crowd in the stadium. Coach Price reached out and put his hand on his shoulder and said, Roy, get up and go on back. The game is only half over. Riggles went back. Those University of California players will tell you that they never seen a man play football as Roy Riggles played in the second half. Roy was later given the nickname, Wrong Way Riggles. It happened a long time ago, but even today, you could find Wrong Way Riggles. Like Roy, you and me, we take the ball and we run in the wrong direction. We humiliate ourselves and disappoint others. But God, like Coach Price, come around and say to us, don't give up. The game is only half over. This was the game, this was the case with Simon Peter. And Peter could have easily called wrong way Peter. Peter was a fisherman when Jesus called him to be one of his disciples. Jesus simply said, follow me, Peter. From today onwards, you will not be catching fish. Rather, you'll be fishers of men. Peter was a confident one. From the New Testament, we understand that Peter had a big mouth. He was always quick to speak and slow to listen. He was the emotional leader of the 12, and he didn't lack self-confidence. When Jesus said, one of you, Peter, you're going to betray me three times, it was Peter who bragged about his confidence, even though all of these guys will 
disown you, Lord. I'm good. But you and I know Peter's failure, he denied Jesus three times. And what was his response? The scripture says, immediately the rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And the scripture says, he went out outside in the alley and wept bitterly. Peter was a big child but an honest one, portraying his master, his friend, his Lord, and disowning him may be too much to bear. We can only imagine what went through his mind when the rooster crowed, standing in the darkness, what all the emotions permeated his heart, his mind. His world has collapsed maybe with a sense of guilt and broken dreams. And what did he do? He went back to fishing. Look at uh, John chapter 21. You can look at verses 1, 2, 3. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel or Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Peter was fishing when Jesus invited him to be fisher of men. We don't know exactly what caused him to go back where it all began. Could it be a sense of failure? Could it be a sense of guilt? There's two kinds of guilt. Guilt is God-ordained. Imagine a world without guilt. It'd be dangerous. Guilt is that part of us within our soul. It's God ordained. But there's a toxic guilt. Toxic guilt is what the Satan, the accuser, uses us to bring us back into our failure. We could na- never make progress and move forward. The fact is that when we fail ourselves and fail God and fail others, emotions of various sorts take us. Guilt, toxic guilt, is multi-billion dollar industry in our country. Guilt is caused by what I have done Versus what I should have done. Guilt is that space between who I should have been versus who I am now. Dr. David Siemens, who had been a pastor for many, many years, and a counselor, wrote this. I am convinced that some of the basic cause of some of the most disturbing emotional and spiritual problems which trouble evangelical Christians, that's you and me, is the failure to receive and live out God's unconditional grace. Just met a guy at ASU recently. Such a colorful life for somebody 20 some years old. And he said, Ben, not only I can forgive myself, I don't think even God can forgive me. 
And the reality is that as human beings, we have found ways to do religious things to ease the darkness of guilt. You look at the Hindu doctrine of karma. The Muslim code of ethics, the Buddhist Eightfold Path, and the legal code of Judaism shows that guilt is real and it is here to stay. But let us not forget that this story is not about Peter. This story is all about the God we came to worship. This story is all about Jesus, the God of new beginning. Three things I want us to see briefly. Number one, Jesus is the God of pursuit. Jesus is the God of pursuit. Look at verses four through six. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. Jesus said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it because of the quantity of fish. How would you respond if you were in Jesus' shoes? Jesus spent three and a half years with these people. They have seen him. After he died, he came back twice prior to this incident. Yet they went back to their old profession. Jesus is the God of pursuit. Jonah ran away from God. But God pursued him. The prodigal son went away. But the father waited for his arrival. Peter and others didn't have much to do with Jesus. But Jesus had much in mind for them to do because he's a God of pursuit. God of the Bible is a God of pursuit. Religion, by definition, is man's search to find the divine. It is man doing the searching. But in the scripture, says no one seek after God. It is God who doing the searching. Last Friday, we were talking to the students. Many of them have never seen a Bible before. And we said, you know, there, there's three major storylines of the Bible. Simple. God made everything beautiful. God created man in his image. Man had freedom to choose, and man failed. Two out of the three major storylines happen within the first three pages of the Bible. From Genesis chapter 3 all the way to Revelation chapter 20, it's all about God's search. God is searching for people. How does he do that? Because the Bible says God has created eternity in the hearts of men. That's one of the ways God searches people. There's a God-shaped vacuum, Augustine said, in every human being that prompts them to wonder, is someone out there? But more than that, God of the Bible is a God of pursuit in a personal way. If you are taking notes, just write down Acts chapter 17. This is a story about Paul at Mars Hill. Paul is explaining to these people about the unknown God. And there, there is this punchline. 
the sovereignty of God and the human will collide. Paul says, God determined the time set for people and the exact places where people should live. Wow. That's pretty special. God orchestrated the life of humans in such a way that they may be able to reach out and find God because he is a God a pursuit. Jesus called them friends to reaffirm his love for them. You know, almost every day, I have people, students and professors, they come to me and say, you know, we really like you. We've known each other for a long time. We really like you. You're a nice guy, Ben. But there's one thing wrong with you. And I said, well, that's, that's a good break. There's many things wrong with me. But, you know, you, you're a little too serious about this Jesus stuff. At ASU, the God stuff is totally fine. After all, there's one God, you know, we all worship the same God. People ask me, why are you so crazy about this Jesus? And I said, show me a God who cooked breakfast for a bunch of morons. <laughs> That's exactly what happened here. Jesus said, hey, friends, you have any fish? And we're going to see in a moment, Jesus didn't need that lousy fish. The scripture says, Jesus already had fish on the barbecue grill being cooked along with bread. Jesus is the God of pursuit. And I want to I pause for a second. There's, a, there's an application for us. For us as believers. Maybe there are people in your life, as I have in my life, people who have disappointed us. People who have done us wrong. Hurt us. The reason Jesus went up, instead of chewing him out, I said, what's up with these guys? You know, I spent all my life with you here. This is the best you could do for me? Instead, Jesus broke the ice by calling them friends. A better translation will be children, boys. Do you have any fish? What comes first? Repentance or forgiveness? I believe as mature Christians, when we offer forgiveness, that prompts a spirit of repentance. Maybe there are people in your life. The word for forgiveness, two metaphor use, one, cancellation of debt. That's what forgiveness is. But forgiveness and forgiveness is taking people hostage. Not physically, but emotionally. I'm, I'm not going to look at you. I'm not going to talk to you because this is what you've done to me. And may the life of Jesus be an example for us to break us and motivate us to reach out to those who have hurt us. And you and I who have the spirit of God living in us, we should be the one able to go out to those and say, boys, girls, instead of staring them as our enemies. Jesus is the God of pursuit. Secondly, Jesus is the God of celebration. Look at verse 7 through 11. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, 
for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off, verse 9. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them, verse 12. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. This was the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Jesus is the God of celebration. Instead of yelling at him and chewing him up, he cooked breakfast for them. Come and have some breakfast. In a, in, a, in a world of religion where man is required to do things to earn their approval from God, God of the scripture, Jesus, the God of new beginning, the God of pursuit, cooked breakfast. And in my opinion, it can't get any better than this. One of the most amazing doctrine in the Bible I will die for is the eternal security of the believer. That simply means the moment we genuinely invited Jesus into our life as our God of worship, there's a whole lot of stuff that took place. The Bible says heaven rejoiced. There was a party happened on your behalf and my behalf at that point of conversion. Angels rejoice. Heaven rejoiced. My name was written in the book of life. I am sealed with the power of the living Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. There's nothing I can do that may God love me less. And there's nothing I can do to earn more of his love. I am totally and fully and loved and accepted by this God. And nothing can separate me from the love of Christ, because it's all about grace. When Jesus died on the cross, and when Jesus said, tell us die, paid in full, that's what it means. Good. Paid in full. All the sins of humanity in the past and present and future is paid in full. Nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. The enemy will come around and use toxic shame that God doesn't care for you anymore. You really mess it up big time this time. But Paul beautifully says in Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39, Paul says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. It was Corey Temboon who said it well. 
God buries our sin in the bottom of the ocean. And he put up a sign that says, no fishing. Well, what do we do? We go back and fish from the past. God buried our sins. But what do we do? We dig. Jesus is the God of new beginning. He's the God of pursuit. He's the God of celebration. And lastly, he's the God of grace. He's the epitome of what grace is all about. Grace is radical. Try to explain grace to someone. Wow. Everybody have a hard time comprehending grace in its totality because there is nothing Absolutely nothing in this planet Earth based on grace. Don't tell me your marriage is based on grace. Everything in life is based on something we do for each other. It's a partnership. But when it comes to God's grace, it's hard to understand because it's radical. A Midwestern farmer who was having a few bad years of harvesting and he wasn't able to make payments on his three different loans with the bank, so he decided to go to the bank and meet with this young manager. He walked in and was greeted, and the manager said, have a seat, sir. And the farmer said, you know, I have some good news and some bad news to tell you. Which one would you rather have first? And the manager said, well, tell me the bad news first and get it over with. So he started. He said, with the bad weather and drought, I won't be able to pay anything on that first loan capital, nor the interest. And the banker looked at it and said, this is pretty bad. He said, no, that's not the whole thing. I borrow money to buy some equipment, and I won't be pay- able to pay anything on that either. By this time, the manager was kind of serious. He looked and said, that's really bad. Well, just one more. We had three loans. That particular loan, to buy seeds and fertilizer. I won't be able to pay anything on that either. By that time, the manager stood up and said, that's enough. Just please tell me what the good news is. Good news is, with a smile on his face, the farmer said, I intend to do business with you. Some of you, just getting it slowly, that's okay. It's a holiday weekend. (laughs) I think the last service was a little more alert. (laughs) See, the reality is, in spite of our moral and religious bankruptcy, God of the Bible wanted to do business with us. That's called grace. That's called grace. And if you and I think that somehow, some ways, we could clean our act together and try harder, it ain't going to work. What God of the Bible wants us to do is come empty-handed, broken, and contrite, say, God, I messed up. Would you do the clean up for me? Give me a new beginning. Max Lucado said it well. But he said, you don't impress the officials at NASA with your paper airplane. 
you got that one. <laughs> you don't impress Picasso with your crayon sketches. You don't claim equality with Einstein because you can write H2O. And you don't brag about your goodness in the presence of the perfect. Look what Jesus, what Jesus did. Verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And you know in Greek language, there's, there's three particular words that were used to, for the word, English word love. One word is eros, the sexual kind of love. And the second word is phileo, means brotherly love, affection. And the third word, the epitome of love, is agape, unconditional love. And it's interesting to notice something here. Jesus asked Simon, Peter, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter's response was, I phileo you. It's like, do you love me? I like you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. In verse 16, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again, the word is agape. But Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I fillet you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? This time Jesus changed word. Instead of using the word agape, Jesus said, Simon Peter, do you fillet me? And then Peter got the point. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I don't want to make a big deal out of this. But the point is, even at this point, Jesus didn't get what he was hoping for. But Jesus, the God of New Beginning, appointed him for ministry. Why did Jesus ask him three times? It's because Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus is the God of new beginning. And verses eight and 18 and 19, I will let you go home and study. Basically, Jesus is predicting how Peter will die. Peter didn't start off very well, but Peter died. He became a martyr. Jesus said, you will die the same death I have experienced. Scholars will say Peter was died by hanging on the cross. Jesus is the God of new beginning. One of the dangers, your pastor, he went on the book of Galatians. Oh, crying out loud, how many years? <laughs> I was joking with him. And you know what he's trying to tell you? He's trying to tell you it's all about grace. He's simply trying to tell you stop trying. Trust in the finished work of Christ. He who has begun a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. Some time ago, I was teaching a class at my home church. There were about 60 people, 60 and up. Some of them were born in church. I'm talking about a Baptist church. And we are talking about the two sons 
the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. And I said, how many of you identify with the older son? Older son who stayed home and did the right thing. But he never saw the father as his papa. He referred to him, I have served you. It's a dangerous place for a Christian to see God as a manager, as a boss. He is my daddy. And once you are a child, you will always be a child. Don't be an older son. Understand, performance-based Christianity is unbiblical and dangerous. One of the most abused, misquoted verse in the entire Bible is 1 John 1 9. Many of you already your mouth moving, you know, you memorized it. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The question comes what if I forget to confess? What if my confession wasn't genuine? And it was Dr. Charles Stanley, a few years ago, I was reading a book on forgiveness. He helped me understand the book of 1 John is not about forgiveness. It's about fellowship. God doesn't forgive me because I confess. God forgives because he is a God of forgiveness. Confession is not to earn forgiveness. Confession is to feel forgiven. I used to wake up in the middle of the night, say, oh, I wonder I, if I really confess. And remember some Christians pray, Lord, if I if we forget to confess anything else, would you just kind of cover the grace, the stuff we forgot? People, God forgives because that's his character. But confession is significant, it's important for us to feel forgiven. And if you haven't got what I was trying to tell you, let me, let me close with this. Let me show you this. This is my, <laughs> one of my granddaughter. She's saying, this is what the toy I've been looking for in my house, but Grandpa had it. This, this is the most amazing toy that embodied the concept of grace. The scripture says, his mercy is new. Every morning, God gives us a clean slate. You know, I'm the holiest when I sleep. <laughs> but when I wake up, that's when I'm in trouble. And my day start clean because God gives me a clean slate. But as the day progresses, my thought, my conversation, the way everything and at night, God takes it away and he cleans it. In the morning, he gives me a new one. That's great. That's why we brag about this God. Because there's no God like Jesus. There's no God. And if you are here this morning, and you had never asked Jesus, this amazing God, who's willing to cook breakfast for you, you're missing out. And I'm going to ask you, would you invite him? Would you invite him? 
to be the Lord of your life? Would you simply say, Lord, I don't understand all of this. But would you come into my life? Change me. I battled four years at a Bible college campus. Wrestling with guilt and shame and refused to give up. And finally, I just cried out and said, Lord Jesus, would you come in and make me new? And the scripture says what? If any man be in Christ, we are new creation. And some of you here today, you need to be Jesus. Do exactly what Jesus did. Break the ice. Reach out to that broken relationship. Offer to give grace. Life. Life is short, isn't it? Even I had a young scholar ask me last Friday, is there a possibility I could just sin and sin and sin and right before I die I could ask Jesus into my life? I say, dude, you have no idea. You will make it through the night. Eliam and I were in Texas last week. A 37-year-old young engineer went to a Catholic church on a Sunday night, was shot to death in the parking lot. Life is short. Release the hostages and enjoy the freedom God has offered to us in the person of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that to rescue us, to, to give us a new life, you send your son. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin, so that in him we might be made righteous. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your willingness to take my place. My sin became yours and your righteousness became mine. Thank you, Holy Spirit of God, for drawing us into a relationship and continue to mold us. We confess we are needy, broken. If you are here and you never opened your heart to Jesus, would you do that now? Simply say, Lord Jesus, I want you to be my worship. And if God has been speaking to you about some issues, dealing with the past and giving it to him, Jesus is waiting. He said, come to me. All you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest for your soul. Would you give that brokenness to him and find his healing. Thank you, Lord, for this church. And even now we pray for John uh, that you will use him in a very special way to meet these people's need. Thank you for this church and the saints who call this home. And We want to see you work and do great things. And we give you our life. Use it and multiply it for your kingdom. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.